Hi, I'm David Marchant, the founder of Offshore Alert, which investigates participants in high value cross-border finance with an emphasis on high confidentiality jurisdictions. Our specialty is exposing investment fraud while it's in progress. Enjoy our content. Good morning, uh, good afternoon or, or good evening. Um, I'm going to talk uh, today um, about financial services regulation um, in the UAE. Uh, with a particular focus on um, anti-money laundering. Um, I want to talk to my own experience. Um, you might notice uh, that I don't um, express a, a firm opinion um, with respect to which of the uh, which of the two the UAE represents a safe haven uh, in a troubled region or a safe haven for financial crime. Uh, it's not that I don't have opinions, it's that I'm somewhat uh, afraid to express them for fear of further retaliation. However, what I hope to do is to present to you, the audience, with some facts. Uh, and Perhaps uh, you'll find I don't need to express an opinion because perhaps you'll consider that the facts uh, speak for themselves. I'm going to quote quite extensively from information that is uh, one way or the other in the public domain. Uh, again, uh, it, it's really with um, uh, an eye to uh, uh, protecting myself and my family against further retaliation. Um, with that, um, I'll move on to uh, a slide describing um, an overview of the topics that I plan to touch on. Um, what I found um, is that uh, I've been a bit ambitious with um, the, the amount of ground that I wish to cover. Um, so, to some extent, I will try to summarise um, some of the things that you'll see on the screen, um, but uh, please do have uh, regard uh, to, to their source. Um, I'm a little bit nervous because I haven't done any public speaking for a very long time, um, and also because of the aforementioned. But anyway, here we go. I shall do my best. Um, to begin with, I'd like to talk about to you about two whistleblowers, myself and another gentleman by the name of um, Amjad Rehan. So going back to October 2012, I was the head of legal and compliance for the Middle East um, and North Africa region at Deutsche Bank, um, based in Dubai. And by then I've been living with my family in Dubai and working across multiple jurisdictions in that region, some difficult, some dangerous, for quite a number of years. <clears throat> I found the role to be extremely demanding, but I enjoyed the intellectual aspects um, that it presented. I was known internally for my strong work ethic and my integrity. <clears throat> um, the future looked bright. Back then, I hadn't heard of a company called Kaliti and I knew next to nothing about the gold trade in Dubai or the revenues that it represents. Um, and I understand that around that time, Kaloti was ranked number one of three large scale refineries in the UAE. <clears throat> one of my roles was to act as the bank's MLRO. Um, and at this point, I should say uh, that my uh, <laughs> presentation is somewhat riddled with acronyms. It seems to be in the nature of the beast. That one you probably know. As the MLRO, I did know that de facto the gold um, industry was deemed to be high risk, um, as were cash transactions. And of course, as we know, due to its anonymity, cash is often a means by which illicit activity may enter the legitimate financial system. I also knew that de facto, the UAE was deemed to be a high risk jurisdiction from an AML, CTF and sanctions perspective. I've been working in the MENA region throughout the Arab Spring and I've witnessed the flight of people and capital from around the region into the UAE. Earlier this year, the FATF Mutual Evaluation Report on the UAE found that as a country it's, it's exposed to significant money laundering and terrorist financing risks because it's a cash intensive economy. Furthermore, the FATF found that their highly active trade in gold, precious metals and stones and the country's geographical proximity to countries destabilised by conflict, terrorism or subject to sanctions presented additional inherent vulnerabilities. In late 2012, Kaloti crossed my desk for the first time. I came to learn that Kaloti was a client of Deutsche Bank in multiple jurisdictions around the world, but was domiciled in the UAE. Its headquarters are in Dubai. 
over a period of several weeks, I raised a variety of con I received, excuse me, a variety of concerning but imprecise fragments of information from colleagues in different locations concerning uh, potentially suspicious activities by Coloti. I felt, however, that I wasn't getting the full picture, and I started to try to investigate the global picture as best I could. <clears throat> then a suspicion about Coloti arose in Dubai. Years later, when I was interviewed by the BBC, I explained what happened next as follows. A colleague came into my office and described a call from a local bank in Dubai. Apparently, they called to ask, are these guys Coloti? Are they good guys? Are we safe doing business with them? I was surprised. That's very unusual. The guys at the local bank had noticed that Coloti had been withdrawing very large amounts of money, so large that they had to remove this physical cash in wheelbarrows. They said, we can see that quite a lot of this money is being funded by a Deutsche Bank account. Self-evidently, this event was a huge red flag and one which I promptly escalated, together with my strongly held view that that event alone required me to file a SAR or suspicious activity report with the relevant uh, regulatory authorities in the UAE, namely the Dubai Financial Services Authority or DFSA and the Central Bank of the UAE. I felt this was particularly important given that it was only one of a number of suspicions which had been reported to me. I also felt that reports should be filed simultaneously in London and New York by my colleagues. I was unable to obtain uh, records of transactions conducted by uh, Coloti overseas. However, I asked uh, the operations head locally to provide me with details of all the transactions conducted on behalf of Coloti in the UAE in the preceding six months. Soon after, I received a very long list. When I added up the cash notional value of those transactions, I was amazed to find that those totaled $5.2 billion. I then immediately took steps to inform my colleagues of what I'd found and noted that these ex apparently extraordinary levels of activity and tried to persuade them again of the need to report not just that, but the other suspicions too. My colleague in New York was particularly resistant to that. As I was later to tell the DFSA's Financial Markets Tribunal, whose role I will come on to describe. Throughout the night before I went to see the central bank in Abu Dhabi, um, I've been in constant contact with one of my counterparts in New York AML. He implored me not to report to the UAE authorities. My colleagues didn't relent, but in any event, I then reported all of my known suspicions to the local authorities in the UAE. I'd felt obstructed in my efforts to fully investigate my suspicions and that I could only see a tiny piece of the jigsaw puzzle. My expectation was that the local authorities would welcome my efforts to investigate these serious suspicions and would be willing to work together with me, the bank, and, their, uh, and use their uh, existing powers to cooperate with the international financial regulatory authorities to exchange intelligence. But in fact, the process of reporting in the UAE proved to be a frightening and deeply concerning experience. The BBC later summarised what happened in the following terms. First, she told the AML uh, Suspicious Cases Unit at the Central Bank. She says that they didn't investigate Coloti, but turned on her and the bank instead. When I explained these very serious concerns, I was straight away met with the accusation that you must have done this. How else would you know? And of course, it's ridiculous, she said. Why on earth would anybody run into the head of the AML uh, uh, unit to tell them that they'd laundered money? It's absurd. And I also reported the suspicions to another regulator, the DFSA. It polices anti-money laundering regulations in the DIFC or Dubai International Financial Centre. Neither regulator that I had reported to actually seemed to investigate suspicions about Coloti, as each regulator started investigating the bank, she said. That was the start of what became a very, very wide ranging investigation, which to me seemed like a giant fishing expedition intended to find a problem of any sort within the bank. What I didn't realise at the time was that I was also the subject, folk, uh, the, the subject individually of their investigation. Back in Dubai days, I didn't know Anjad Rehan. 
In 2013, Mr. Rehan had been a partner at Ernst & Young, also based in Dubai, and he had conducted an assurance audit of EY Dubai's clients, Coloti Jewelry International. That same Coloti entity was the subject of my SAR reports back in late 2012. <clears throat> Mr. Rehan went public in early 2014 as to his experiences. As reported, he'd led an Ernst & Young inspection of Coloti Group, the largest refiner of gold in Dubai, to check that its gold could be shown to be conflict-free by international standards. Mr. Rehan decided to speak out after details of the inspection were not published. Mr. Rehan subsequently brought an action in tort against his former employers, which was eventually heard at the Royal Courts of Justice in London in early 2020. Mr. Rehan succeeded in his claim. As Reuters reported, a former partner with EY has won damages of $10.8 million for negligence in breach of what was characterised in the judgment as an audit duty owed to partners and employees. It was described as a duty to take reasonable steps to prevent them from suffering financial loss by reason of the firm's failure to conduct assurance audits of clients ethically and without professional misconduct. In his judgment, Mr Justice Kerr said that Rehan had become aware that Coloti was knowingly dealing in gold bullion which had been smuggled out of Morocco, coated in silver. The silver coating was intended to deceive the Moroccan authorities into believing that it was silver, thereby avoiding gold export restrictions. The silver was then declared to be gold on arrival in Dubai. Furthermore, Rehan had found that in 2012, Coloti had taken part in cash transactions in gold involving about 5.2 billion dollars. Mr Justice Kerr stated that these facts had given rise to a reasonable suspicion that Coloti was involved in money laundering. The supplier was called Renade International, which, as it later turned out, was run by two brothers, subsequently the subject of an investigation by French police, leading to convictions in France on charges related to drug trafficking and money laundering. The EY team had subsequently uncovered transactions involving gold from Sudan and the Democratic Republic of Congo and from Iran, which was subject to US and EU trade sanctions. Rehan's case was that he had informed a local regulatory body, a Dubai government organisation called the DMCC or Dubai Multi Commodities Centre, about these irregularities. Rehan's case was then that the DMC had progressively put improper pressure on him and EY Dubai to do its reporting work in a way that would, and I quote, reduce to vanishing point the visibility of the Moroccan gold and cash transactions issues. This meant that readers of the relevant reporting documents were misled into thinking that Coyote's business practices were sound, when manifestly they were not. Rehan asserted that EY had colluded with the DMCC in that regard, which had led him to resign, publicly disclose the wrongdoing and to flee Dubai out of fear for his safety. The judge said that while the DMCC was the local regulator of the precious metals industry, its stated main purpose was to cultivate the gold industry in Dubai and to raise the profile of Dubai in the international gold trade. As such, Mr. Rehan had described it as a conflicted regulator. The judge also found that gold is recognised internationally as being amongst the conflict minerals most attractive to criminals and terrorists because it is easy to move and holds its value well. Moving on to say a little bit about the concept of the free zone in the UAE. Within the seven emirates which make up the country are a large number of commercial free zones. Locally, these are often referred to as offshore jurisdictions, although they are geographically onshore. From a commercial perspective, the key difference between onshore and offshore has been that in the latter, companies may have up to 100% foreign ownership, whereas in the former, foreign ownership was capped at 49%. Very recently, a relaxation of these foreign ownership rules has been announced, 
but it remains to be seen what impact this will have on the free zones in the future. Each free zone has its own regulatory authority and its own rules for the licensed companies. However, federal laws, such as that criminalising money laundering, continue to apply within the free zones. Each of the DMCC and the DIFC are free zones. I will focus now on the DIFC. You should see a picture um, of uh, probably the centrepiece of the um, DIFC, um, the uh, gate building in the foreground behind it, the Emirates Towers. Um, for context, um, the DFSA um, sits at the top of that uh, gate building um, and opposite them on the same level, um, the uh, DIFC authority. Uh, below them sit, sit the regulated firms and all around them. As a jurisdiction, um, geographically, the DIFC is something like about 220 acres. Set up in 2004, it houses a wide range of firms, uh, financial services firms, professional services firms, stock exchange, high-end retail, hospitality and DIFC courts. The IFC courts have been described as a uh, island um, of common law in a sea of civil code. According to their website, the DIFC courts administer a unique English language common law system offering swift independent justice to settle local and international commercial civil disputes. These courts based in Dubai provide certainty through transparent and forcible judgments from internationally recognised judges who adhere to the highest global standards. The DIFC court's successful track record supports Dubai's growing its status as an international business hub while serving companies in the UAE, GCC and worldwide. The regulator of financial services in the DIFC is the DFSA, who describes himself as its independent regulator. However, the DFSA is a governmental organisation. DIFC bodies such as the DFSA are required by statute to act with transparency. This inherent obligation was enshrined by legislation at the DIFC's inception. As to purpose, um, the centre will have, without limitation, the following objectives. To be a financial centre in the Emirate based on principles of efficiency, transparency and integrity, and to promote the position of the Emirates as a leading financial uh, centre. Turning to what happened uh, with respect to offering up AW, that's me. Um, the regulators, the DFSA, instead of uh, investigating the Coloti suspicions I had reported, started investigating me in the bank, um, as I've said. Subsequently, the DFSA brought enforcement proceedings concerning another matter against me and also against the bank, but not against the bank's most senior management. I challenged the regulator's findings, but I was unsuccessful. The DFSA banned me from working in the financial services industry indefinitely and imposed a substantial fine. The related judgment does, however, uh, record that there was no evidence that any action was taken uh, by the DFSA to investigate client K, that's Coloti, um, and that Mr Bock, who was running the uh, investigation at the time, confirmed that he and Mr Guna uh, of DFSA supervision did not discuss the serious underlying concerns in my SAR. The judge found that this is consistent with the absence of any investigation or action thereafter, and indeed the DFSA's express statement um, from the then Chief uh, Executive Officer, Mr Ian Johnston, that neither Colotti uh, nor his group of companies was or had been the subject of the DFSA's investigation. In his evidence, in my case, Mr Bock said that the investigation of uh, a, a, an SAR was not the task of the DFSA. Note also that in the judgment, no basis was given for the anonymisation of client K, that's Coloti. I found that the process of obtaining discovery of relevant documents and information concerning my case has been extremely challenging. However, 
after pursuing some of my own investigations, a memorandum annotating and memorialising a discussion between two of my managers based overseas and two senior lawyers at Clifford Chance came to the light. That document describes, and I quote, an approach to offer up Miss Waterhouse in order to express settle a DFSA enforcement case against the bank. To pause there, I'd like to invite um, those listening to consider how they would feel if they came across such a memorandum and if their initials were there instead of AW. This evidence was before the tribunal deciding my case. Also before the tribunal was a letter written subsequently by Deutsche's lawyers. It, it, it had been sent between discussions, it, it had been sent, excuse me, during discussions between Deutsche and the DFSA, which led to a negotiated settlement of the DFSA's action against Deutsche. In one passage, the letter states that the DFSA was proposing to issue a decision notice against Deutsche containing language so critical that it would seriously damage, if not end, the career of four senior named individuals, Ashok Karam, Nadine Massoud, Philippe Rosavolo and Andrew Hume. What's missing from that slide is what, the, uh, what, what else the letter said, um, which included the following wording. Deutsche Bank's lawyers said that removing those individuals from their roles would very significantly undermine the bank's ability to continue operating effectively in Dubai and would have a material impact on its operations and the future of its franchise across the MENA region, given the regional roles of, of two of the named individuals concerned. No action was ultimately taken against any of those senior individuals and a negotiated settlement was agreed between the bank and the regulator, which included a reduction of the financial penalty imposed on Deutsche Bank. The DFSA stated publicly that they had no part in the plan to offer up AW. But I'm not persuaded, as I consider that they were actors in the plan being put into action. The tribunal considering my case also knew that Deutsche Bank had, back in 2015, withdrawn all allegations of wrongdoing against me, including those for which I was ultimately sanctioned. The tribunal published its judgment against me soon after I went public in the BBC documentary. That joint investigation of, of BBC Panorama and Premier Lean shown that cash from Coloti was a crucial part of a $250 million money laundering operation which used gold sales to launder cash from British and European drug deals. In a related BBC article published, I commented, with this decision, the Dubai Financial Services Authority has sent a very loud, very clear message to the market about what happens to whistleblowers in their jurisdiction. They get punished. Turning to some recent um, FATF uh, findings. On April 30th, 2020, it published results of its mutual evaluation of the UAE in its report, the FATF said that the UAE needs to make fundamental and major improvements to ensure that its systems are more effective. The report rated 11 key areas of AML effectiveness in the UAE. However, it found that the UAE was, uh, had substantial effectiveness in any one of those 11 areas. The areas where the UAE scored a low level of effectiveness included international cooperation, access to beneficial owner information, the investigation and prosecution of money laundering offences and the prevention of raising funds for the proliferation of weapons of mass destruction. The UAE authorities compliance with international standards um, is now the subject of monitoring um, for a year um, from the date of that report. Following that, that period of monitoring, a decision could be taken to place the UAE on FATF's grey list, which includes non-compliant jurisdictions um, deemed not to meet international standards uh, and best practices. At the time when I filed my SAR, the UAE Central Bank said that I should be reporting not to them, but to the DFSA. And the DFSA later said that it was not their job to investigate SARS. In fact, I reported quite de detailed suspicions and then additional evidence obtained through further investigations to each regulator. 
Mr. Bott's evidence to the tribunal in my case was that it was not the task of the DFSA to investigate. Um, however, uh, that appears to be at odds with what's said on the DFSA's website, which includes the following wording. The DFSA also strives to detect and prevent money laundering activities within the DIFC and will work closely with the UAE Central Bank in this vital area. In its documentary, the BBC stated that the money laundering could have been stopped years earlier if concerns by us had been properly investigated. On 21st of September 2020, news of the leaked FinCEN files was widely reported. Those comprise over 2,500 documents, many of which are SARS. It transpired that multiple SARS concerning Coloti had in fact been filed with FinCEN by a variety of institutions. These reports highlighted um, thousands of transactions dating from 2007 to 2015, totaling um, 9.3 billion US dollars. A day later, the BBC reported that a USDA investigation codenamed Honey Badger concluded that Coloti was involved in a scheme to transport or transfer tremendous amounts of illicit value through the use of gold as a commodity. The BBC also reported that no action was taken in the US. However, as quote, former officials said that it was put off a decision on the recommendation, concerned about the reaction of the UAE, a key diplomatic ally where Coloti was based. When the UAE failed to act on its own initiative, the investigation was shelved. The ICIJ also published an in-depth piece on Coloti, in which John Kassara is quoted as saying of the UAE, money goes in, money goes out, and nobody enforces anything. Change of topic. Um, speaking now about my second legal battle, through years of investigations and processes, it appeared to me that the DFSA had not disclosed all of the relevant documents and that without its documents I would be unable to participate fairly in my regulatory challenge. In those circumstances I filed a data subject access request seeking disclosure of specified classes of documents and information which it held or processed about me. The DFSA refused to comply with my request and I did not obtain these materials ahead of my regulatory challenge. Eventually, I complained to the DIFC's data commissioner asking that an investigation be launched into the refusal. The data commissioner um, upheld my complaint, issuing a notice against the DFSA. The commissioner found that the DFSA had contravened Article 17 of the relevant uh, data protection law at the time by refusing to comply with my request. The DFSA was directed to comply within 30 days. Instead, the DFSA requested the Commissioner to review his decision. The Commissioner upheld his decision upon review. The DFSA then transferred the matter to the DIFC courts. In consequence, I had to argue my entire challenge without documents. Whilst application was made for the proceedings to be stayed in those circumstances, that application was denied. In the litigation which followed between the Data Commissioner and the DFSA, I argued my case alongside the Commissioner. I was joined as a, an interested party to the litigation. The case was heard by a retired English High Court judge. In a replacement judgment issued on 12th of August 2020, the judge found for the DFSA. The Commissioner and I have since been denied permission to appeal the Court of First Instance Judgment. I do not now have the ability to challenge that outcome. Whilst the majority of the DFSA's grounds were in fact rejected, the Court found that compliance with my soul would place a disproportionate burden on the DFSA. However, I consider that this finding is internally inconsistent with the finding in the same judgment that the DFSA's, uh, rejecting the DFSA's submission, that complying with the relevant DPL, uh, data protection law requirements, would be too expensive. As the judge stated, would having to find this sum likely prejudice the DFSA in the discharge of its functions? In my judgment, it would not. In the first instance, the money would be met from the DFSA's budget, and to the extent necessary, it will be met by funds from the Dubai government. 
Within the FMT uh, proceedings, that's my regulatory challenge, the DFSA admitted that they opened their investigation into my actions in response to my filing the SAR. A document, namely an internal memorandum confirming this, emerged at one of the hearings. In these circumstances, I consider it reasonable to assume that there are other related DFSA uh, internal documents uh, concerning the decision not to investigate or whatever decision was taken and or concerning their decision uh, not to liaise with other enforcement agencies or what indeed happened next. Given all of the information which is now public concerning Coloti and the FATF findings, I consider that there is a great public interest in the DFSA disclosing the documents I sought. But unfortunately, I lack the means to be able to require them to do so. My regulatory challenge was the first substantive challenge brought against the DFSA. Over the years that it has taken, I've experienced a lot of unusual things, but I have only time to mention a few of them. By way of contrast, it's open to an individual facing a regulatory sanction by the FCA in the UK to refer the regulator's decision to an independent court. However, in the DIFC, things are different. In fact, the FMT who have the power to uphold or reject the decision in whole or in part are appointed by the DFSA, and I understand that they are also paid by the DFSA. As such, I do not consider them to be independent of the DFSA. Immediately after closing submissions in my own case, a BBC journalist attending the hearing in London overheard what he believes to have been a conversation between tribunal members and the DFSA concerning the drafting and preparation of the judgment. He gave a witness statement to that effect, notwithstanding my application for bias, apparent, inherent and actual, was rejected by the FMT's president, Mr David Mackey QC, a retired English High Court judge. The hearing took place in London and a few hundred metres from the Royal Courts of Justice within the heart of London's legal establishment. Before the hearing, I had explained that I wished to make my own submissions in my own words at the hearing, but that was not allowed. I understand that retired English High Court judges are not regulated by any professional standards body. In correspondence with the legal ombudsman in the UK, I also learned that barristers who they do regulate in the UK are exempt from their oversight when conducting overseas litigation, such as DIFC proceedings, regardless of whether some um, or all of that work is performed in the UK. I think it's also important to note that at the time of the filings, there were no whistleblower protections available under DIFC law. Within the proceedings, I submitted a large number of statements from character witnesses of good standing, which, as the judge acknowledged, spoke to my impeccable character in both my personal and professional life and my great skill and com competence as a compliance professional over many years. None of those witness statements was challenged by the DFSA. One of the DFSA's witnesses that I wish to challenge was Ms. Seren Al Masri. Ms. Al Masri had been the head of private wealth management for uh, the Middle East and Africa region at Deutsche Bank. In the event, she said that she was unavailable to attend court for cross examination and she was excused. We wish to cross examine her about certain findings made against her in the Deutsche Bank internal anti bribery investigation. That investigation is called Project Dastan. We also hope to challenge her credibility as a witness on the basis of those findings. Since then, certain of those findings have been publicly reported by the Financial Times back in uh, January of this year. During the DFSA's investigation of the bank, Ms. Al Masri admitted that she had provided misleading information to the DFSA, and yet she faced no sanction. Let's talk a little bit more um, now about uh, what, what the future might hold. Um, 
seems that I have uh, speeded up and come to the uh, end slide a little bit ahead of time. Um, so uh, I shall say a few words about what I'd like to see change based on, on, on my experience. Um, and I have to say I'm looking at this mostly from a UK perspective and a UAE perspective, but that's simply because um, those are the jurisdictions with which I am most familiar. Um, I would like to see um, the extra jurisdictional uh, protections afforded to UK whistleblowers abroad. I think that there are already on the statute books in the UK uh, uh, several laws with extra jurisdictional effects. And I think that um, affording uh, the protections that exist uh, under other legal systems and, and indeed um, um, uh, being built on uh, in, in terms of the EU at the moment um, to those uh, individuals who act within the spirit and the letter of UK law but happen um, to uh, find themselves in a, in a jurisdiction where perhaps those same protections don't exist. I think that that would be something that uh, might, may not help me any, but it might help other people in the future. I would also like to see an end to the recognition and enforcement of DIFC court judgments by the English courts. Um, I would like to see the regulation of legal practitioners and the judiciary overseas, um, wherever they practice, be it um, partly from uh, out of London or, 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 or um, in, in those overseas jurisdictions. For many reasons, I would also like to see um, a prohibition on the use of restricted non-disclosure agreements and confidentiality clauses in uh, legal agreements settling employee disputes. Um, that concludes my presentation. Um, I'd like to thank uh, listeners for their um, time, attention um, and patience. I'd also like to thank the uh, conference organisers for giving me a, a, an opportunity to speak today. Thanks for watching. Consider subscribing to our investigative news and documents service and attending our events. For more information, visit offshorealert.com.